Hey everybody and welcome to video number two for chapter 24 where we'll be talking about the formation of states. So while the Reformation and the Thirty Years' War uh, were particularly devastating for the Holy Roman Empire in terms of splitting it you know, along Catholic and Protestant lines, it did lead to a further consolidation of power in states like England and France. Uh, first, let's talk about the failed attempt to revive imperial, imperial authority with the Holy Roman Empire. And for that, we got to talk about these guys called the Habsburgs. Uh, the Habsburgs were a very powerful German family that accumulated a vast amount of power throughout all of Europe. Uh, they did this through conquests and marriage alliances. I'll show you guys a map in a little bit, all the areas they controlled. Um, now, the closest they came to achieving a true European empire was with Charles V. Um, he inherited Habsburg, Austrian, and German lands, as well as regions in France and all of Spain. You know, he inherited lands both on his father and his mother's side. Again, the Habsburgs were very good on picking marriages. Um, and, you know... For Spain, he also inherited all the Spanish territories now in the Americas. Now, his reign was defined by constant struggle of, uh, against both, you know, domestic and foreign enemies. Actually, first, let's look at the map. Yeah. All right. So you look at it. Lands, the orange lands are inherited directly by Charles V. So you've got Spain. And then you've got Austria down here. You've got the, what they call the low countries. We're actually going to talk about these guys a little bit later. They're called the Low Countries because, I'll just go to Low right now, uh, because of low lying down along sea level, particularly in the Netherlands. Uh, they have a lot of trouble with flooding. It's basically Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg in there. And then you got some other scattering here throughout the Holy Roman Empire and the bottom of Italy, including Sicily down here also. All right, so kind of scattered out. That's what he inherited. Now, gained by Charles, he gained areas in here through Central, I'm sorry, through Eastern Europe. Um, and then some uh, areas that he was allied with, such as England and Portugal, and the enemies of Charles. We're going to talk more about them in a sec. We're talking about France, and we're talking about the Ottoman Empire down in here. Not sure why I can't write on that area. All right, so let's talk about his enemies. Uh, as I said, both inside and outside. He inherited German territory that was in constant religious conflict between Protestants and Catholics. That's why all of these areas in gray were not allied with him because these were Catholic held, I'm sorry, these were Protestant held territories that were not a big fan of the Catholic Charles. Uh, he came into conflict with both France and the Ottoman uh, Empire, who both viewed him as a threat. Uh, Catholic France even went so far as to back Lutherans in Germany. Uh, you know, they thought it was more important to hurt Charles than to keep it as just a strictly Catholic versus Protestant type of uh, problem. And obviously, uh, the Muslim Turks didn't like anybody, you know, who was Christian at that point. And they certainly didn't like somebody who could be a very powerful empire. France even backed the Ottoman Empire against Charles at one point. You know, so France not showing a lot of uh, really, you know, consistency with its religious uh, siding. It's more just about power. Um, eventually, you know, he because of the constant fighting, Charles got tired of it all, and he eventually abdicated his throne and lived the rest of his life in a monastery. His empire was divided between his son Philip and his brother Ferdinand. All right, so Ferdinand basically took all of this stuff. And Philip gained not only Spain, but he also gained everything over here as well. Okay, so Philip ended up doing pretty well for himself. But Ferdinand became the next Holy Roman Empire, uh, Emperor, sorry. All right, so with the failure of a really centralized power in Central Europe and Germany, um, you know, and you had a little bit of, uh, you know, centralization going on in the Italian city-states, strong states did emerge in other parts of Western Europe at this time, most notably in England, France, and Spain. In England, you had Henry VIII. In France, you had Louis XI. And in Spain, you had the joint monarchy of Ferdinand and Isabella, or Fernando and Isabel, as they are more properly known. Uh, they were representatives of what we call these new monarchies. Um, all of these rulers, they developed, first and foremost, new methods of finance, such as direct taxes on sales and property, the way that we have today. Um, they also, you know... Um, uh, they used it in, uh, to enhance the treasuries. And when you have money in treasuries, then you can use these for things such as increasing uh, the size of your government. They expanded the size of their personal armies, especially. You know, they were constantly fighting amongst each other. And they significantly curbed the powers of nobles. So again, moving away from the decentralized era of feudalism and more into a centralized power structure. 
Now, religious conflict also added to royal power in these nations as monarchs used religion to justify their use of royal power. The most prominent example of this is the Spanish Inquisition, which nobody ever expects. Um, the Inquisition was started by Ferdinand uh, and Isabel in 1478, and they eventually received official papal permission, and it was meant to root out heretics among the population. Uh, so you'd go before trial and before inquisitors, and they eventually expanded their power so they could go after political opponents as well. Now, it wasn't quite as barbaric as popularly thought today, but punishment still could be severe for uh, heresy or for going against the government, as you see this guy here being tortured on a wheel. So burning at the stake, that type of thing, it did exist. All right, a different type of government you see are constitutional states. So as countries like France and Spain continued to expand royal power, some countries had monarchs that ruled alongside representational government institutions. An example here is England. England did not have a written constitution. Even to this day, they don't really have a single written one. But the tradition of limiting royal power through a legislative branch goes all the way back to the Magna Carta in 1215. This was not always received well by kings and their supporters. All right, so the struggle of checks and balances coupled with religious conflicts, that would eventually lead to the English Civil War. Um, this was from 1642 to 1649. Um, oh, didn't mean to hit that, but we'll get to these guys in a sec. Now, so the Magna Carta said that kings were supposed to get Parliament's permission and approval before raising taxes or doing anything big with money. As I said before, English kings, they weren't particularly fan of this, so they tried to resist this check on their power. So you had king versus Parliament on one side. Their supporters for the king were known over here as, we'll just write, cavaliers, calves. And then over here on the other side, these guys were known as roundheads because they would cut their hair and keep it in very close cropped uh, hairstyles. Um, that was more indicative, you know, less of the, I should say that was less indicative of their support of parliament and more of their uh, religious views because these guys were Puritans. Okay, so you had the Anglican Church on one side supporting the king, and they were more of like the royalists and the nobility and so forth. And then on the other side, you had the Puritans. Uh, they were Protestant as well, but they were Calvinist uh, zealots, okay, very, very zealous uh, supporters of Calvin's teachings uh, who wanted to purify the church by getting rid of all the old Catholic ceremony and hierarchy. Now, the result of this war was that Parliament side won, and King Charles I was put on trial for crimes against state and executed. And that sent huge ripples throughout of Europe that the people of a country would execute their sovereign. Uh, the Puritan government that took over after Charles's execution eventually became a dictatorship that most people resented. And this led to a further uh, round of conflicts that would culminate in the Glorious Revolution in 1688. It was called Glorious because it was bloodless. Uh, at the time, the monarchy was restored. Uh, this guy, King James II, was in power, but he was a Catholic, so not winning over too many people. And Parliament kicked him out, and they put his daughter, Mary, and her Dutch husband, William uh, of Orange, in power. So you had the joint monarchy of William and Mary at that point. Uh, from that point forward, the English king would rule in cooperation with Parliament, uh, which is obviously true to this day. And a slightly different type of constitutional government emerged in the Netherlands with the Dutch Republic. Now, in the 16th century, the Low Countries... Again, let me just erase this. Okay, so here are your low countries, the Netherlands, Belgium. I still got to figure out why it won't allow me to go the whole way with it, but whatever. Okay, you got Belgium, you got the Netherlands, and you got little Luxembourg down in there. Um, they were ruled by King Philip II of Spain. Uh, Philip was a Catholic, and the Netherlands were majority Protestant. So in 1579, a group of uh, Dutch provinces proclaimed the independent United Provinces. All right, so this is what it would eventually look like. You've got the United Provinces to the north, and then the Spanish Netherlands to the south. Eventually, all of the all of the Spanish Netherlands would gain their independence. Also, each province was governed by a representative assembly. Uh, this was the first republican government of the modern era, really since Rome. You know, you had some going on in the Italian city states, but outside in Western Europe, this was the first. Europe did didn't have much experience with representational governments, but both England and the Netherlands combined popular religious uh, and political support uh, for government power. Now, these were the exceptions, though. You still had plenty of these, your absolute monarchies. 
so Europe still had monarchs who held absolute power, claiming to derive their power from God, right, divine right, and the ruler who best epitomized absolutism was Louis XIV of France. He was known as the Sun King. So that should tell you just a little bit about how much he estimated himself, the sun, the center of everything, the giver of light. That's the image that he took for himself. He once declared, la tat siest moi, I am the state. All right, so he was everything. He made everything about him big and grandiose. And this was exemplified in his palace at Versailles. Now here you have current pictures of Versailles with its incredibly impressive hallways and the courtyards, these, you know, with the hedge mazes and things like that. Uh, he, this started as a royal hunting lodge and he built it into the most splendid building in all of Europe and he made himself the center of everything there. He developed elaborate court rituals when meeting him and he brought many of the nobles to live there in high luxury. That was the payoff for allowing Louis to exert absolute control. Right? You want to live here in the good life? Let me do whatever I want. Another type of absolute monarch was Peter I of Russia, also known as Peter the Great. He was the most important of the Romanov czars who would rule up until World War I. Uh, he wanted to make Russia into a military power and sought to make it more like Western uh, Europe. Traveled throughout Europe to learn more about other countries and made several reforms after returning to Russia. Uh, he increased the size of the army. He put more emphasis on education, overhauled the bureaucracy, and even made men shave their beards. He said this was representative of our old ways. we got to be more like they are in West with clean shaven and so forth. Uh, this was met with uh, significant resistance from conservative Russians, but he would just strip them of their power. Again, absolutism. Uh, another example of a Russian monarch is Catherine the Great. Uh, she was born in Austria, but she became empress when her husband, who was Peter the Great's grandson, was assassinated. Um, here's a picture of Catherine. And she was one of the uh, so-called enlightened despots. Uh, they were absolute rulers who were influenced by the Enlightenment and made social reforms, but she showed her other colors when there were peasant rebellions and she strengthened her autocratic control to suppress them. So her whole enlightenment reforms were largely just for talk in the beginning. Okay, real quick here, we'll talk about the balance of power. Uh, regardless of what kind of government a nation, a European nation had, the 17th and 18th centuries were uh, defined by a delicate balance of power. It's often proved difficult. You know, the foundation for this system of European states was laid down by the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. It ended the Thirty Years' War. Um, I'll get to that in a sec. It resulted in mutual recognition of most European states. It did not end the war in Europe. In fact, far from it. Okay, a little I'm screwed up with the uh, animation, but you guys got the idea. So here's a gathering of all the European leaders. And this is what Europe looked like after the Peace of Westphalia. So you're starting to see a little more clearly defined nationhood status for places like England, France, and Spain in particular. Um, it ended what it did end. So it didn't end war, but it ended the possibility for strong imperial or papal authority throughout Europe. The Holy Roman Empire was not going to be able to consolidate its power like they hoped to do under Charles V. No one nation wanted the others to become too powerful. So you have this constant checks and balance. This delicate balance of power rested on the principle of militarism. Militarism acts as a deterrent. It's the same concept as nuclear deterrence in the 20th century, where whoever has the most nuclear weapons will be less likely to be attacked. In this case, they built up their militaries, both in the inevitability that they would uh, go to war with people and in the hopes that France figured if we have a bigger, stronger military than Spain or a bigger, uh, bigger, better navy than Spain, they'll be less likely to attack us. But militarism, this military buildup, would typify the extension of royal authority and state building during the 16th and 17th centuries. All right. So a lot thrown at you with that one, I know, but hopefully we're able to digest it all. And then we'll get into more of kind of some economic changes that were happening in Europe for the next video.